Hello there, podcast listener. Welcome to What Scares Us, a podcast from the Ann Arbor District Library where four friends talk about movies that are scary, gross, maybe not so scary, etc., etc. My name is Matt. And I'm Christopher. I'm Amanda. And I'm Allison. And today we are getting into 1981's The Beyond from director Lucio Fulci. A um, couple of quick facts, fun facts, and trivia about the movie. It is also known as And You Will Live in Terror, The Afterlife, <laughs> or The Seven Doors of Death in the United States, where it was heavily edited to remove pretty much every gore sequence to achieve an R rating, because otherwise it would have been an X-rated movie. This is the second part of director Lucio Fulci's Death Trilogy, which also includes House by the Cemetery and City of the Living Dead, all three starring Catriona McCall, who is Liza in this movie. It had never been seen in the USA in its uncut form until 1998 when Grindhouse Releasing restored it and screened it. Roger Ebert reviewed it in 1998 upon its re-release with a scathing review, mm. giving it a half star. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I read that. Youch. It's pretty rough. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino loves this film, so much so that he released the reissued DVD of the uncut version through his Rolling Thunder Pictures, which is the copy that I owned initially. Visual effects were done by, I'm going to butcher this name, Germano Natale, who is also famous for working with Dario Argento on Suspiria and Deep Red, Mm. as a couple of examples. A um, f- little fun fact. I was reading some quotes from Lucio Fulci where he was really slamming Dario Argento. He was talking about different directors and like what they loved. It's like, this director loves this. This director loves this. Dario Argento loves himself. <laughs> so clearly there's some weird competition there or something or was. And then another, fu- my final fun fact, Fulci himself said that he did not intend for this movie to be coherent. It was merely <laughs> supposed to be a succession of surrealist images. And though he originally intended it to be a haunted house film, executives insisted that he add zombies to make it more profitable due to zombie movies being all the rage at the time. What? Yeah, it kind of makes, I mean, we'll get into that a little bit later, but it kind of makes some of the zombie stuff make more sense because it certainly feels pretty tacked on to me. Yes. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Um, well, I have an eye roll about what you just said. <laughs> I, I think he nailed it. <laughs> nonsensical? Yeah. It certainly is nonsensical. Um, I just wanted to say that even though Lucio Fulci didn't like Dario Argento, I think Argento paid for Fulci's uh, funeral, didn't he? I, I think, think so. He died. Yeah. Aww. Yeah, I remember reading that somewhere at right. one point. Even though they were in competition, I think that I think that they probably still admired each other quite a bit. Yeah, they must have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's a really nice gesture. Yeah, yeah. So, Amanda, why did you roll your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't rolling my eyes at what you were... S- oh, I was, yeah. Not at you, but just, right. like, the fact that the zombies were added on later, that was my eye roll. Like, yes. I, I'm glad that you said it was meant to be incoherent because I was like, I checked that box. <laughs> yeah. And I had many questions, and I'm used to things not having to make sense. I understand that not everything has to make sense or have a purpose or a point, mm-hmm. and especially with cinema... It doesn't have to, especially, and I fully understand that. But for this one, I was trying to figure it out. Um, (laughs) But then I didn't understand the whole undead thing and the zombies. So I didn't know what you just said until you said it. And that was my eye roll of like, of course, somebody had to add that in post (laughs) to make it the, the... so. It, uh-huh. almost, it almost feels like they're covering their ass by saying that, though, where it's just like, oh, shit, this turned out bad. Yeah, we meant for it to be incoherent. <laughs> but, but supposedly that was the plan. And to me, the whole movie, and I say this lovingly, feels like they're like, it's like a an exhibit of what's the coolest special effect thing that we can do here? And then a little bit of dialogue and then more cool special effects stuff. But that said, I... I personally really like this movie. So I had never heard of this movie or seen it till now, so I was happy to watch it for the first time. Oh yeah, I forgot that when we when we've talked about it, when I told you guys we were going to watch it, none of you had seen it or and or heard of it, no, which I was really not at all surprised by. Oh really? Yeah, because I I just kind of assumed like when you go to like a comic convention or a horror convention thing, you'll see all kinds of memorabilia and shit from this movie. Ah, at like so much so that when. First time I saw this, I was in college, I think. I think it was maybe 18 or 19, and a friend showed it to me. 
and I pretty much immediately recognized a couple of images, mainly the the Spike character, it's like the zombified guy yeah. that's mm-hmm. kind of on the cover of everything and uh, appears fucking everywhere in this movie somehow. <laughs> um, but I had never seen it, and I knew nothing about it, and I knew didn't know what to expect. Like you, I was trying to make sense of it the entire time we were watching it, and then I kind of gave up and just had a lot of fun with it. But yeah, that was my first experience with it, so... Oh. Cool. Yeah, th- this is the first time I'd ever seen it, and for me, it took me right back to high school days, watching movies that we had rented on a VHS. So we saw Zombie 2, also known as Zombie, yeah. uh, <laughs> depending on where you get it. Yep. And th- it was really interesting to think back on that movie, watching this one. So this one came out a few years after Zombie 2, right? Two years later, yeah. yeah. Yep. And and he had hoped to leave the zombie thing behind because he claimed that he <laughs> that he made the definitive statement. And he had he has some like quote attributed to him where he's like, I wasn't inspired by George A. Romero. I was inspired by somebody else, which is why i I filmed it in the Amazon or whatever. And um and that movie is also pretty rough around the edges and doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. But it, has very cool effects in it. Yep. I think done by the same guy, maybe. I might have to edit that out because I don't know if that's true. Okay. <laughs> eh, leave it in. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah, I'd never heard about this movie. I knew not. I, I didn't know Fulci was a guy. I knew absolutely nothing. But um, I loved this movie. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. And I'm really, this is like so funny to say, but <clears throat> if we hadn't watched The Fog... Before, I don't know if I would have enjoyed it as much, but the hmm. fog just changed like so much of my mindset going into horror movies. Yeah. Um, and then I also <laughs> just had to get over myself and realize that truthfully, I'm just, I'm never going to be scared by another horror movie ever again. No. Mm-hmm. And once I got over that, like, it, it's just fun. This is a really mm-hmm. fun movie, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I think, too, you mentioned the fog. There were, a, it was a very different movie, but there were a couple of elements. Like the zombies and having the the book, um, like that kind of reminded me of the fog in a few different ways. Yeah, it's it's like a, a poor execution of what the fog pulls off, where it's mm-hmm. like something bad happens and then a bunch of little bad things start happening all around the town. But in yeah. this case, it's not crystal clear. <laughs> yeah, that one, yeah. The purpose of that was more specific as yeah. far as like um, the people in the book getting revenge. Whereas yeah. this one, it's like who, what, when. But of course. We're not supposed to understand, and it's... <laughs> Supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, here we go. Let's try to let's try to make sense of this movie as per <laughs> a synopsis that, uh, that kind of gets all the points. So we begin in New Orleans, Louisiana, 1927. An enraged posse of men descend on the isolated Seven Doors Hotel deep in the swamps. They grab an artist named Schweik, who is cloistered there. Accused him of being a warlock and then dragged him down into the cellar where he is savagely beaten with chains, tortured with quicklime acid, and then crucified with his wrists nailed to a cellar wall despite his dire warnings of evil that is to be (laughs) unleashed. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you guys, but the audio in this movie is pretty rough. So it's kind of hard to tell that he's what he's saying to them. I think the first time I watched it, I didn't pick up that he was trying to warn them about some sort of evil that was going to be unleashed. I thought he was just a weirdo that they were beating up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't understand. I thought he was just a hotel guest and he was painting. And then they <laughs> this mob came in and we're just going to like, they killed him. And I was like, well, I don't know what's going on. Maybe he's a sacrifice or maybe he did something. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love the guy who's working the front desk that night. <laughs> 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 just rows and rows of guys coming in with chains and things. And yeah. He's like, huh? I don't know. I also he's, lo- <laughs> he's almost smirking as they're walking yeah. past. He's also extremely sweaty. Yes. <laughs> it's like, yes. again, this is one of the very first. They do a lot of big, uh, very, very close up shots, and it's a very close up of his face, just full of sweat. Full of sweat, and his and, eyes darting uh, along with them. Yeah. And there's yeah. like 12 guys just running past. Yeah. Dude, I'd be sweating too if all those people came in my hotel. <laughs> I'd be out the door, actually. I right. don't make enough money to deal with this. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, let's see, 1927, when was air conditioning invented? Probably, I don't know, and they definitely didn't have it there. No. <laughs> he made me laugh. Also, they could not have picked a creepier-looking guy <laughs> to play Spike, <laughs> um, who, who got his start working in a bunch of, like, 
old spaghetti westerns that Sergio Leone did, including Duck, You Sucker. Mm. Um, huh. mm-hmm. Oh, the classic. The I, classic. I totally know that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It has James Coburn in it. Um, yeah, I love this opening sequence. It's weird that it's in sepia, and mm-hmm. I like the gr- super terrific gross-out gore like immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- every time there's something like this in the movie, it's like the camera comes in on it like the like they're saying look at this yeah <laughs> and it, it at first it's like it feels patronizing and then it just becomes funny mm-hmm. to me that anytime somebody gets hit i know that we're going to get right in there on it and really look at it yeah. it's like microscopic and i too thought it was interesting that the beginning was sepia because when this man is getting um whipped with this very heavy metal chain and his like lashes just ooze open it's in sepia so Mm -hmm. and the liquid that's dripping it looks kind of like clear it's not doesn't look gelatinous enough to be blood yeah but watching it in like this sepia black and white i'm like what what okay that's supposed to be blood but i did like that right away you know that if somebody does get hit you know that they're going to zoom in and it's going to get really creepy the practical effects are so it's so bizarre, and I couldn't wait to see a scene where there was um, a lot of violence and gore, so I can see it in color to see what they did with the color. So I was excited to see a color <laughs> scene with some gore. <laughs> Something I had read along the way is that the German release of this, the beginning, is all in color. It's like it's huh. almost like the sepia thing was a remnant of a censored version or something that got left in, and ultimately hmm. they're just like, well, it also makes it look old. Yeah. That's just a guess, <laughs> but. Um, but yeah, no, we're certainly treated to full color gore for the rest of the movie beyond this. Yeah, I loved this opening. I yeah. thought it was super effective because the whole time you're like, what's going on? Like, why are they doing this? What are what are they moving towards in these super slow boats? Yeah. Um, and then you see uh, Schweig and you're like, oh, okay, I'm not doubting why this mob wants this man whatsoever. This guy is weird. He looks like a monster. <laughs> <He's> super weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what is he drawing? Like all these like dead bodies yeah. in like a weird gray desert. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Although the one thing I kind of thought about and this is totally spurred by um, I watched this movie called Impedicore which is I want to mm. say Indonesian but one of the ideas in that movie is um, you can't like end a curse you can only create a new curse Ooh. and so the whole time i was like why do they think that killing this man is going to stop this house if anything they're going to create some new evil mm-hmm. you know what i mean yeah so then the whole time i was just sort of on edge like oh, yeah. these idiots what are they doing they're making it worse they're making it so much worse right now and i don't yeah. understand why naturally usually when a mob goes to do something they don't they don't do a good job no <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did like too how after they they take him down to the basement of this hotel, and so you you know that this is like a, earlier. This is 1927. You know it's going to be present day at some point, and so I did like that setup of knowing mm-hmm. that there was a man who had been crucified and beaten to death and covered in acid in the basement. So what's going to happen to his body? Is somebody going to find it? I didn't think he'd be a zombie at some point, but so I did like that setup of like knowing like okay. Some, we already know that right. the hotel is going to be creepy and something is going to happen, but I liked knowing that this was the beginning, and I was very curious about the painting. Yes, yes. They, they One thing that is true about pretty much anything in this movie is they, if they're showing it to you, they're going to explain it to you later. It might not make any fucking sense, but they're, <laughs> but they're definitely going to show it to you again and again and again and again. I also thought of you, Matt, during this opening sequence because one of my notes is just like... Why do they have lit torches inside of this house? Like, this is fire safety hazard. It's extremely dangerous. What are they doing? <laughs> there are a lot of things that occur in the in the hotel, like doors being left open that you're just going to get bugs. And yeah, yeah it's, yeah. it's yeah. there are a lot of poor decisions that are made all throughout this movie by the directors, but also by the characters. Yeah. But now that you say that, maybe that is why the doorman was sweating so fiercely was because of the, <laughs> the flame. It's like it could so be. one past his ear. <laughs> it was a lot of fire. Yeah. Yeah. Also, if if it's the gateway to hell, yeah, maybe the doorman is sweating because there's oh. a doorway opening. Yeah. Mm. Oh my gosh. Also, he's a doorman. Oh, whoa, whoa. I just figured out the whole movie. <laughs> also, I take it all back. <laughs> okay, so they all had the torches, but they didn't burn the place down. No. 
So what the fuck were the torches for? Just to look menacing? That's what Allison's asking. They don't have yeah. really yeah. poor eyesight. Yeah. 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 Better hallway huh. vision. I just had never thought about that until yeah. now that it's just like, yeah, usually when they take those torches, they're going to burn someone alive. Instead, they just threw quicklime on him. Anyway. It makes sense. <laughs> they also <laughs> crucified this man. <laughs> yeah. They sure did. <laughs> it makes sense, though, when they're crossing the water in those boats to have illumination. But then, like, oh, it sure. seems like you wouldn't yeah. have gone, or maybe this is how they made it look more old timey. Right. To have. Right. Yeah. Just <laughs> they had electricity in the hotel. In the 20s, yeah. I don't yeah. know. So, anyways. Yeah. Doesn't matter. We also are mm-hmm. treated, I believe, at that point, to a quick glimpse of a of a ghostly blonde woman who yeah. is walking around the hotel, who just chilling upstairs while this out. is happening. And then she, yeah, and then she moves on. Other other than the stuff that we covered, I and this is true for the rest of the movie. Lots of very stylish camera work. Yes, um, which which really helps the movie a lot, even when really. Even when stuff that doesn't look so great is happening, they still find a way to keep it interesting by moving the camera a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and playing with the focus, too. Yeah. So much. There was, they, they kept doing this split screen where something in the foreground would be in focus and something in the background would be out of focus mm-hmm. or switching it up. Yeah. I, I noticed the, the filming so early on and mm-hmm. it, yeah. it, it really does carry a lot of the movie. Yeah. It's, it's, it is technically a very a very good movie. Mm-hmm. I also like the sound and the music, oh. and also yeah. like the lack of sound. Like at the beginning, man, you mentioned the um the sound quality. It was very for dialogue. It was very hard to hear, and I had to like jack up my sound. But as soon yeah. as the music started, it got really loud, and I had to like jack my sound back down. <laughs> yeah. yep. But I did like the way sound was used in the movie a lot. Oh too. yeah, the music is great. I am a huge fan of this score and basically all the stuff that Fabio Fritzi. Does he actually still tours um, playing the score from this, and oh, like wow. he'll do live scoring along with it? And there is a, a version of this that comes out, I think, this year, where he um, he created a composer's cut in 2020, which was all these unused cues because a mm-hmm. lot of the silence that's in the movie he fully intended for there to be pieces there, but they just didn't use all of them. I guess that like the Maybe the tapes were damaged or something, so they couldn't use the originals. So he re-recorded all of it in 2020, and it's terrific. I think the version they're releasing has that composer's cut, but it also has all the originals. So so maybe by the time this episode airs, that will exist. Yes, supposedly. I don't we'll know see. if there's a date for it yet, but I remember. But when I was doing research for this, I saw that there was a new... You know, one of those like Rhino or whatever, one of those companies that just is constantly shilling stuff like this out yeah, cool. to people like me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep, get the Sun Coast kids, the the cassette tapes coming out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They just got me with the fog. Um, <laughs> but anyway, all right. So moving on, we are now in New Orleans again, but it is 1981. Liza Merrill is a young woman who arrives from New York City to claim the hotel as her inheritance. No sooner has architect friend Martin Avery begin to show her around the property, but and strange events begin to happen. A painter falls off of his rig and is horribly injured, coughing up blood and babbling about the eyes, the eyes. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. John McCabe arrives to take the injured man to the hospital and offers Liza some sympathy. Next, a plumber named Joe attempts to repair a major leak in the flooded cellar. However, he is murdered by a presence that emerged from behind a slim caked wall. The atmosphere at the hotel is further chilled by the creepy looking servants, Arthur Mar- and Martha, who apparently came with the hotel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she can't do anything about it. They came with it. Can't fire yeah. them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then Martha discovers Joe's dead body in the cellar and another much older cadaver lying in a pool of dirty water nearby. It is apparently that of Schweik, the artist. My notes for this section, uh, Arthur is a hilarious little smeagly kind of guy. <laughs> yep. Um, it with Also, uh, I forgot to mention this in the first section, the dubbing in this movie is <laughs> yeah. some of the worst, but I love it. Me yeah. too. Um, yeah, I, for a minute, I mean, I had to think, I'm like, are they speaking Italian? Nope. It's just, nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. It's just that bad. Some of them are, I think. But then, like, most of the English mm-hmm. actors, like, like um, 
uh, David Warbeck and Catriona McCall, like they're speaking English, but for some reason they were like, I don't know, let's just not let them watch the footage. Let's just have <laughs> them re- re- record it yeah. separate. <laughs> but it's not as often, it doesn't happen super often, but the times it does happen, it's not jarring. Like, yeah. I d- it didn't bother me. And if, and usually I notice things and something like that will annoy me. I'd yeah. be like, oh, look at this. It's not perfect. But for this, it didn't really matter It's like for espe- me. Especially once, like, there are four people in the scene who are all supposed to be dubbed over and they're all doing such a bad job. You just kind of <laughs> go, oh, okay, this is just what it's like. Right. <laughs> yeah. I got really hung up on it because um, mm-hmm. the main girl, Liza, I couldn't tell if she was dubbed or not because her mouth matched, like, mm-hmm. what the sound, what sounds she would be making. So I was like, oh, it's not dubbed. And then you see some of those, uh, like, tertiary characters, and you're like, oh, my God. Oh, this is definitely dubbed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But they're all speaking English, though. All of the actors were English. Pretty much. spoke English. I think pretty much. Then Um, why did their mouths not match? (laughs) I don't know. It's like they changed dialogue later because maybe the script was not oh, final yeah. or something. There are a lot of goofs all over the place in this movie. Yeah. Um, One thing I read was that the majority of the cast were English speakers while Fulci spoke Italian. So they had to have somebody translate the language barrier. Yes. So they did a lot of miming, making faces and moving his body in order to make the actors understand what he wanted of them. Yeah. So I just wow. thought that was interesting. Huh, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. That, man. That had to be difficult to work with him. Mm-hmm. There was one person who worked in the production production manager or somebody. Um, he, he acted as a translator and tried to interpret through the shoot, but still, even going through, like, what if that person didn't agree with Fulci and is trying to translate mm-hmm. it for, like, an actress? <laughs> right. And he's just like, I'm not I'm not listening to you. <sighs> yeah. Well, that's why we needed 94 re-releases to get it right. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I love after the painter falls off the scaffolding and is looks dead to me. Very dead. (laughs) And they've got him upstairs in this bed and the doctor comes in and says... We need to get him to a doctor. (laughs) No shit! He is... He is examining him and all he comes... We need to get this guy to the hospital. And then he proceeds to carry him so carelessly. (laughs) And he's just like spewing blood everywhere. It's like, how did you get him from outside dead and inside up the stairs of a hotel in a bed and he's still coughing up blood and looking... He looks very colorful and peaked and alert. It's like you are... how long does it take for this doctor to come in in his blue right. jeans and be like, get him to a hospital? And like, why did they move him? <laughs> yeah, don't move him. Why are they letting him bleed out on the couch anyway? Yeah. Like, do they it's not like, have ambulances in Louisiana in 1981? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, they had to fire up the, the horse and carriage and get those torches ready. <laughs> right, yeah. They do very quickly kill off another another worker, Joe. <laughs> Joe the plumber, Joe. classic name. Joe the plumber, <laughs> yeah. who... Offers her a smoke. He just walks in. Anybody home? Yep. <laughs> he lights up. And hey, <laughs> it'll take as long as it takes. Uh-huh. And he's right. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Yeah. In my experience with plumbing issues. <laughs> when he goes downstairs to find the water, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, when he just kind of starts chiseling away at the brick, who cares about what's behind it? You notice that he's up really, really high. And then the next scene, he's crawling through a hole that's down really, really low. Oh, really? (laughs) It doesn't really make sense that water would be coming from up that high, too, based on the flood, but... Dude, they might as well condemn this whole building right now. There's like two feet of water there's in the too basement. Much water in the you basement. don't mess around with basements and foundations no. like that. And well, there's no knows? running water in this place, but there's a flood in the basement. Also, Louisiana, no basements. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Of course yeah. not. But this Which, was filmed in like Pittsburgh or something? No. they fi- Okay, so there were two filming locations. Louisiana, which was pretty much all the exteriors, and then uh, one studio in Italy. Italy, okay. Yep. Um, so like that that basement set piece, I'm guessing, was, mm-hmm. on, was on a soundstage in Italy. Um, but but it's, I mean, the basement, you, you're closer to hell when you're below... It's true, and I bet that that was a conversation that they had. Mm -hmm. They were like, this is... So I think you're on the same wavelength Mm -hmm. as them in terms of thinking. Don't give me that much credit. (laughs) 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 Um, Anything else about this section? Oh, this section, um, after Joe dies, I suddenly realized, wait a second, this isn't color. (laughs) 
Yes. It took me like oh, yeah. 10 minutes to realize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because the blood, well, the blood from the man who fell off the scaffolding, his mm-hmm. blood in his mouth was so red. Yes. Um, they didn't zoom in super close on his mouth, though. But I did like, um, like in the beginning, you mentioned the ghost woman that was walking around. I didn't see that. And so when he was on the scaffolding and that woman quickly appeared with like the white eyes yeah. and he fell backwards, I was like, oh, crap, what's going to happen? Right. So I thought that was a really cool, jarring way to like be introduced to like the malevolent being that that, right. in, that could potentially be in the hotel somewhere. Yeah. And I love the look of her eyes. Like mm-hmm. those contacts are so weird. They're like off white. Mm-hmm. I just thought they were really They're cool. They're kind of pearly. They're awesome. They they look like I mean they look like someone that has like heavy 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 cataracts or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they're a little scarier. It's like when you pause it and look close at them, there's a bunch of weird little figuring in them that is uh, very cool. I feel really bad for the for the actors who had to wear those. You bet. Yeah. They looked awful. Also, speaking of eyes, uh, Joe, we get our first instance of <laughs> eyeball gore, which yeah. of which there is a lot. In yeah. This. <laughs> um, he just kind of thumbs his eye out. Pretty slowly, too. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. <laughs> I think that's exactly what they wanted you to do is go, ugh. <laughs> it's not my favorite eyeball hopping out in this movie. No, m- mine either. But it was, but it is merely the first instance. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a really cool noise in this section, too, that reminded me of like, um, like the clock noise that's in Stranger Things or... Mm-hmm. Um, like there's this weird dissonant noise that used to happen in um, the TV show Lost all the time. It had like very similar vibes to that, mm. and it came up a couple times in this movie. But it starts here, and I just oh. thought it was really cool. Yeah, they they layer in like so. I actually when I watched this, I didn't want to disturb Lauren because she was trying to do real work. <laughs> um, so I will listen to it on headphones, and I noticed whenever they're doing something really gross, there are so many layers of like scratching and like stuff shuffling mm-hmm. around, and yeah, um, sometimes it didn't make any sense. I got. Sometimes there was like human voices. Yeah. And I'm like, none of this is in this room. It's just like this sound that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Again, <laughs> weird sound design stuff. Yeah. I thought the exact same thing. There were so many sound effects and dubbed in bits mm-hmm. everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, sometimes they're so loud and they seem really not so obvious i mean they don't seem exactly clunky but they do seem really obvious sometimes but i love it oh i think it's stuff like that that just puts this movie over the top yeah it's like it's the sound design is almost exactly like the makeup effects where it's just like let's go as over the top as we can and make everybody so uncomfortable during Mm -hmm. this sequence (laughs) and it works it works really well but it also stays fun right Mm -hmm. i'm I'm curious if i would have felt that way in 1981 i probably would have people were probably horrified by it i mean so much so that you couldn't see this version in the united states and for a long time but it's a video nasty (laughs) <laughs> well, too, and I feel like after s- nowadays or even in the later 80s and 90s and beyond, like you get used to gore, like in 81, this is a lot of like very close up, very disgusting, like right. gore, like body body gore, mm-hmm. which is awesome. Yeah. And mm. melting and yeah. So much acid. Yeah. We'll get, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> I did have a question about the hired hands because they say that they came with the house which kind of reminded me of like um, Haunting of Hill House or The Others or something. Mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. fully expecting them to be like in on it somehow or um, like somehow connected or maybe they were ghosts or something. But mm-hmm. they just seem like two really weird people. <laughs> <laughs> just and a couple of weirdos. <laughs> like they die. So how much do they really know about it? You know what I mean? Right. It yeah. seemed like kind of a dead end thread. Are they yeah. just unlucky? I think so. They just make poor professional decisions. <laughs> I think that they, I'm guessing that they were like, let's make them look all shifty and weird so that everybody wonders if they're, if they're in on it or if they're evil or malevolent or whatever. And then they just kind of end up not yeah. being. <laughs> yeah. I actually like that about it because it sort of subverted what I was expecting. Yeah. Man, it's nice to hear all this praise on this movie that I <laughs> fully expected all of you to be like, what the fuck, yeah. man? <laughs> I mean, it's definitely bizarre. Yeah. But yeah. it's all of the elements. It's the sound quality or the sounds, um, the music, like the acting I didn't even give two craps about. But oh, yeah. I don't think anything is great. That And the ladies were annoying. A lot of annoying things in this movie, but I was yeah. drawn into like the cinematography and the shots and the the close-up literal like mi- microscopic on these 
you know, gore. Mm-hmm. That's what was keeping me in. And plus, it was like, what was 83 minutes? Perfect length. Yes. You bet. If it would have oh, been absolutely. two hours, 10 minutes, I would have been like, hello, can we be done now? Yep. Yeah. But it was a great little, you know. Short commitment. Yeah, in and, and there was a lot of things in it that were drawing you in or keeping you interested yeah. when you're like, what's going on? But like, it didn't even bother me that I didn't understand anything. Sometimes if there's a really like cerebral horror movie, I'm like, well, why is that ghost there? And where did he come from? And those things all have make so much sense and are so like um, on purpose. And this one, maybe in his mind, it is, you know, in Fulci, but as a viewer, like it does not, you're just there to be entertained. Yep. You know, it and I think drags. it's successful. Yeah, yeah. yeah I really, it, like, I barely paused it. Yeah, you that's know, great. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I totally agree. I knew nothing going into it, but I couldn't help myself when I read a couple of reviews on either Shutter or Letterboxd or something. And one of the reviews was like, "You want a movie with no plot that makes no sense at all? You got it." Like, <laughs> so I had such low expectations, and I was actually surprised by how much of it fit together and made. I don't think there's that much ambiguity in this movie, to no, be honest. It, it, I think it's just mostly about feelings. Like, this feels like a nightmare to me, and it's got nightmare mm-hmm. logic. Yeah. So, like, it doesn't make sense, but of course not. Like, when mm-hmm. I'm having a dream, it's like, oh, I have to get the medallion to my fourth grade teacher by midnight or my parents are going to die. And then you wake <laughs> up and you're like, what now? Like, I had to do what? <laughs> yeah. <Like> the talisman. <laughs> I, oh, I, I just like made that? that up. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's similar great. to that. <laughs> that is not a dream I've had either. Just, oh. <laughs> it, is, it is very dreamlike, and I think that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Is it's just sort of like a dreamscape of you don't know what's... Yeah. You know, things don't have to make sense in a dream. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of dreamlike, we are now driving down the 14-mile causeway to New Orleans Ooh. when Liza encounters a strange blind woman standing in the middle of the desolate highway. This is where they introduce my favorite piece of music in this, which is that really strange, haunting, dissonant piano piece yeah. that comes back over and over again. I love that. It's the coolest. Um, the blind woman introduces herself as Emily and tells Liza that she has been waiting for her, although her eyes are occluded with cataracts. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I did not write this synopsis. I found this synopsis and it covered all the beats. So if I read something that doesn't make any sense, I'll just pull it out (laughs) in post. (laughs) (laughs) Liza drives Emily over to her opulently furnished house in New Orleans. Liza is warned by Emily to leave the hotel while she still can. So I do find it amusing that Liza is just driving fully in the middle of the road down that. No one, no one's around. Um, beautiful shot though very beautiful shot so lovely I thought it was just so arresting to look at this yeah. uh, and this wide view of of the road and the water man so beautiful it was one of my favorite shots in the movie mm-hmm. and it also no, plays same. specifically to like some of my actual real life fears which I can't swim afraid of oceans I hate those like highways that go over long yeah. stretches of water <laughs> I'm afraid of basements <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it, Fulci. <laughs> and cataracts. All right. <laughs> um, it's interesting, too, how Liza is so trusting, and she just gets in the car, and her and Emily and the dog, Dickie, just drive to that, that lush place. I was, like, gaga over the beautiful plants and ferns everywhere. Oh, yeah. I thought that was such a cool, like, palate cleanser just in this dark, weird, spooky, gross basement. Yeah. And you've got this, like, lush, you know, it looks like a safe space. Yep. With Emily and this dog. It's a very cool house. Um, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Dickie's, it's a- Dickie's a good dog. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Dickie begins as a good dog. <laughs> <laughs> that house is, like, an actual historical house in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't know if this is factual, but I read that they damaged the floors filming because they had oh. a bunch of sand everywhere. I read that too. I believe that. Um, I l- really loved this part, and I promise I won't talk about this for very long, but it reminded me so much of um, Disney's Haunted Mansion. Yeah. Like the piano riff that plays. Yep. It It's somewhat reminiscent of that, and it kind of ties into this like gothic haunted house mm-hmm. imagery that they have going on. Totally. Um. Yeah, I thought all of this was really cool. Oh, and also the um, Haunted Mansion in Disneyland is um, like Southern Plantation themed. It's not like a hmm. right. typical haunted house. But so much of this part, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. Disney. Well, too, I mean, it sounds like this was an inspiration for that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I'd like mm. to think so. 
Yeah, I mean, if if you go with the idea that before they slapped on the zombie stuff, that this was just going to be a like haunted house bump in the night kind of thing, you know, it makes sense that that house fits the part. It looks great. Um, meanwhile, while this is going on at the hospital morgue, <laughs> oh man, the the <laughs> most hospital. sterile morgue and yeah. and and good working environment that that <laughs> I've ever seen at a hospital. All I could think of is THX 1138. That's what the <laughs> whole morgue looked like to me. It was so weird. I don't know why it would be like weirdly dome shaped like that, but mm-hmm. with all the strange little doors off of it but that did not open i also liked how the bodies were just kind of laid out in a circle it's on these slabs <laughs> <Yep. laughs> so only, weird yeah. and a yep. good party yeah it was beautiful. some in bags some not it was beautiful yeah yeah um it did remind me of alien when they sure when it, the oh, opening ship. scene when they all wake up yeah yeah um, so John McCabe is performing an autopsy on Joe the plumber while assistant Harris wants to install an, an EKG machine on the corpse. <laughs> John laughs it off and leaves for lunch while Harris <laughs> remains behind to install the machine. After Harris leaves for a call, the machine begins pulsing with activity. A little bit later from that, Joe's wife, Marianne, I missed that her name was Marianne. I don't, I don't know if this person made this up. I've never no, heard it that. Is. They say that. Um, for the first time at the funeral. I was going to say oh, when Mary's okay. Her. Yeah. okay, that makes sense. Uh, Joe's wife, Mary Ann, arrives with her daughter, Jill, to dress up her husband's corpse for the funeral and kind of struggles with it, yeah. understandably. <laughs> where, she, <laughs> where she is killed in a horrific way by being scalded with acid. Jill is then menaced by the re- <laughs> reanimated cadaver of Schweik. Love that... Um, Dr. John is whistling while he's stitching up, uh, <laughs> stitching up Joe also has a very interesting placement on, of his mask that I, yeah, <laughs> I definitely, I remember thinking that that was funny the first time I saw it, but now that we're also accustomed to wearing them and we know that how they're supposed to go, yeah. it's, just, it's particularly funny to me now. <laughs> also there, the sign, uh, going into that says do not entry, which I, which I, I enjoyed. I love that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> And yet, Marianne just busts in. Yep. No one invites her in. She just oh, somehow yeah. knows where to go. I, just, oh, I do not entry. This is this is me. I have that. Yeah, I, I have that same note, which is love that she just knows where to go, yeah. how to get in there. Just helps herself. <laughs> yeah. Just leaves uh, Anna Green Gables outside in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> I was so. I was just like, how is she out allowed to be, get in that room and be there? And then she very successfully completely clothes her dead husband in a suit and tie. She brings scissors. She's cutting fabric t- to help. But she can't lift that dead body. No. Like, you need multiple adults to, like, move around a dead, like, a corpse. You bet. And she just, like, he's in full pants. And I was just <laughs> like, it's only a movie. doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, he looks very cleaned up, though, after he's just fully, like, his whole face was, like, Fucked up. It was gross and oh. so much red. And I'm like, his beard looks very clean now. Yeah. They really did a great job. And he just looks, yeah, like he's laying there having a nap. And she's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That part just like cracked me up because the doctor guy, when he leaves, he says, I'm warning you, though. When I get back, I'm going to give him an autopsy. Yes. First of all, what else were you planning uh, on doing? Isn't uh, yeah. that like the main point of this room? <laughs> And then I love that while he's gone, this lady comes and, like, dresses up her husband. It's like, I don't think he can perform this autopsy and when your husband's in, like, a full right. no. three-piece right. suit. No. Like, now I got to undress him again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I mean, she's grief-stricken. That's just the, what she wants to do in that moment. I don't know how she's allowed to be in there or physically able to lift him up and put a shirt on him. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I was I was just thinking how much fun it would be to work on this movie, and someone says, "Bring me fifty gallons of bloody foam." Yes, oh, oh the foam that the was so gross good. blood foam. Yeah, and the and the unsecured lidless jar of acid on top of a on top of a wobbly cabinet. <laughs> yeah, and and the fact that like so after she's taken down and falls and knocks the acid over. Her daughter is just kind of paralyzed. And I understand that it's probably supposed to be she's paralyzed with fear watching, but she is just watching this happen. And it creeps so, it gets so close to her before she even moves. I yeah. was like yelling at the screen, like, get out of there. Yeah. Jump on top of one of the slabs. Yep. Like, why are yeah. you standing there on the floor? Ride your dad out of there. Yeah, get on up there with Pep Pep. <laughs> I like too how on the scene when the, the slow foam is like, 
heading towards her that they still do close-ups of the face where there's a- acid and blood just like spitting out of it like vertically horizontally it just i'm just yes please just let it burn it's, it was just a really good scene i really really enjoyed the scene a lot <laughs> and it's one of those gore scenes where like it starts with the spookier music and then it weirdly switches into that like funky kind like of like almost disco music. porn <laughs> music <laughs> Which, by, by the way, I love. It, like, adds this weird... Um, adds this weird levity to every scene. It's just, like, you're watching... The acid is melting her, but it also is strangely, like, exploding her skull at one point. <laughs> which is just horrible, but also probably not possible. No. And then there's just this, this like, funky-ass disco beat playing over it that just that just prob- probably is to lighten the mood. And it works for me. (laughs) That's like one of the things that makes this movie so fun, though, is like, yeah, they're showing you like gross, horrible shit, but there's just like a sense of like play in it. I just thought it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I really liked about this um, like morgue scene is it kind of reminded me of um, the Juwan series, um, like Mm. the Grudge movies, Mm -hmm. um, where the curse follows people who have been inside the house so like i don't see another reason why this would be happening at the morgue except for this curse on the house has now like transferred like they've traveled to the secondary location which is also now cursed Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i just thought that was cool well, they have the old guy, the warlock. What's his name? Schweik? Schweik? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know his name. Schweik? Schweik? How do you say his name? He's there. He's the one who has the, like, the cathodes attached to his brain. Right. Like, they're the one, he's the one who's supposedly back alive. <laughs> but eventually, I mean, if, later on in the movie, they come back to the morgue. And then when they go downstairs, they end up in, I'm getting ahead, but they end up in the hotel. So I also wondered about the connection of, you know. There, there. <laughs> how many doors and. Yeah. There is a thing. very loose explanation to, to connect all of that, that we can, that we can eventually get to. Basically, we're not supposed to understand at this point, but essentially like that door being in the basement, which they keep alluding to, and the audience kind of knows, but for some reason, no one else, everybody gets all the way, th- almost to the end of the sentence of figuring out. There's a door to hell in the boot, and then they get cut off. They almost figure it out. It's like the idea is supposed to be, and I think this was also true in City of the Living Dead, is like once you open one of those doors, it starts affecting everything around town, yeah. which is why all this- seeping out. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You're, so you're right. Um, I do have one more note about this scene before yeah. we go back or go forward. Um, I noted that at the end when the daughter is screaming, she's screaming, and then it blends into the next scene where there's a loud trumpet in a bar. My oh, yeah. most favorite transition in the movie. I love I love it when sound in movies or TV shows transfers from one scene to the next. I love that that sound editing so much. And here it was so great because the daughter's scream was so loud and piercing. Then there's just a scene where it blends into this like more uplifting musical scene with the trumpet. And I was just like, oh, yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. I was just here for that so much. Oh, yeah. It, it's a hilarious cut to a jazz band. <laughs> yeah. Um. I also really liked like uh, 10 seconds before that, she opens a thing and that corpse like falls forward towards her. Yep. I just thought that was really cool. Yep. Poor Anne of and Green he would have just been standing in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That reminded me of the Goonies um, yeah. when the stiff's in the freezer with the ice cream. Right. It reminded um, me of the fog because oh. that guy in the boat and Jamie yeah. Lee Curtis, he, she he, doesn't he fall on her? Out of a something? locker. Yeah, yeah, out of a locker after she's like, we got to get the fuck out of here yeah. or whatever she says. But yeah. I guess in this, you know, very sterile, white, s- spherical morgue, yeah. they don't stack <laughs> bodies in the freezer, you know, on slabs vertically, they just kind of stand them in the corner. Stand them, stand them up individually yeah. in a weird little room off of the morgue. You just stand here, buddy. Stand here. You lost your eye and some of your cheek. Just, we'll stand you up here naked. It must have just looked cool. So, like you said, we transition from Scream into a jazz band where Liza meets John McCabe. Oh, is that his name? Yeah. Anyway, he meets Dr. John in a downtown bar. To discuss her misgivings and anxieties. He expresses puzzlement when when Liza explains uh, the ineptitude of her weird servants. <laughs> John claims to have never heard of them before despite knowing everyone in the area. Then a phone call from the bar arrives from Harris who informs John that Marianne's body was found in the morgue while Jill was huddled in the corner frightened and unable to speak. 
After Joe and Marianne's funeral, Emily appears again to Liza that evening at the hotel. Emily tells Liza about the warlock Fike, who stayed in room 36 at the hotel, and about the supernatural underworld that the hotel conceals. The hotel was built over one of the seven gates of hell, and Schweik had been the guardian. Emily is about to reveal more when her hands wander over to a canvas depicting a desolate vision of lost souls in a terrible and arid landscape. Suddenly very afraid, Emily says that the painting was painted by Schweik before he died, and she runs out of the hotel power into the night. But Liza notices a disquieting fact over and over and over again in a bunch of cuts. <laughs> About her sudden departure, Emily made no footfalls on the bare wooden boards as she ran, and neither did her seeing eye dog. So <laughs> spooky. I'm glad you're telling me what happened in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't catch that? No. Oh. <laughs> that there's a lot of stuff that happens in those couple of scenes. Um but it made me laugh a lot the first time I saw it, how many times they needed to show you, like, hey, she was running and it was quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at it again. It was quiet. Do you see that it was quiet? And it's almost like there's a ding at the end of the scene where mm-hmm. she where she puts it together. Yeah. I, let me see, my notes that I have. At one point they were having a, when they were in the bar having the conversation and she was talking about what she would do if she were to leave the hotel behind. She said something about going on relief, which I had no idea what that was. Yeah. You guys probably already knew, but I I looked that up and I guess that's to be on government assistance, but that's more of a common phrase in the UK. Oh, so it really? was like an ad, it's almost like it was an ad-libbed thing uh, by the two English actors or something. Um, I like somehow knew that that's what she meant, but I didn't look into it. Yeah. I did think it was funny. She, She's like, I did everything that a woman can do in New York City. And she's like, dancing, secretary. I almost became an unsuccessful fashion designer. It's like, I can think of a couple more things you could do in NYC. Yeah. <laughs> she was, yeah. She does everything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. <laughs> She's a gal about town. Um, I did like the um, at the funeral. Did they yes. go to the funeral after the bar? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Yep. And um, which is in that like blurb that I that I just read. All right. Uh, but yeah, so it so we we see them at the funeral. Um, it's also where it's revealed that Jill now has the. Jill's now wearing the contacts. Yeah. The little girl, yeah. <laughs> Don't know how nobody else noticed that at the funeral. Exactly. <laughs> she's on her own now. Like, right. She's, a, she's yep. emancipated. She's <laughs> yeah. going to have to look for a new place to live. Left she's to now, wander the morgue. <laughs> she's, she's a ward of the hotel now, apparently. Yeah. Right. So one of my questions through the whole movie was, white eyes equals good or bad? <laughs> right. Because Emily, she was on the causeway, right? Yep. Yeah. She's trying to help. Mm-hmm. But then lots of the other people get get the white cataracts. Well, it's certainly not good for them. Right. <laughs> right. But, Sorry, Jill. Your parents are dead <laughs> and your eyesight's over. That's true. But she's still good at that point, right? And Emily is a good character. Unclear. Yeah, it's very unclear. Okay. Yeah. Also, why yeah. was Emily even at this uh, funeral? Mm-hmm. Right. She's just yeah. like hanging around. Yeah. Like several blocks down. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I feel like, and this isn't really explained, but I sort of just presumed that Emily, she knew about the book, she knew about the Seven Gates, and she didn't, and she knew about the painting and what the painting meant. Um, she knew all of these things, and she was trying to prevent it. She wanted the woman to leave. She didn't. She wanted it to stop. So I feel like something must have happened to her, or as to why. I figure. I just figured she was undead. Whoever had the white eyes was sort of undead, like a little. And this Emily was represented like a good spirit or mm-hmm. a good like guiding her to like get because Emily wanted out of whatever loop or whatever hell hole they opened, or she wanted out of whatever was happening. Yeah. It doesn't explain to me why the other dead people got turned into zombies or how their eyes are white. Like, I just figured there was some sort of a backstory with Emily that we didn't know of that kind of presented itself as to why she was trying to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, why? also, why Why does she have the dog? I don't know. <laughs> She's blind. blind. <laughs> so is everybody around. else. The right. girl Jill, she doesn't have a dog. Jill's got no resources at yeah. this point. Right. Jill needs anyway. to, to see go on relief. <laughs> seeing right. eye dog yeah. for blind zombies. <laughs> <laughs> who want to do good? The only one, the ones who want right. to do good, I guess, right, get a dog. Right. <laughs> right. Is there? Aww. Yeah, that's our familiar. Anyways, um, I didn't catch this. I actually, 
On my lunch break today, I watched the first, the opening scene and, and the closing scene of this again. Mm-hmm. But I think Emily says something along the lines. I'm not sure if she's reading directly from the book of Ibon or whatever, but she says something along the lines of she's been collecting information on this for thousands of years or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Which um, I had a lot of trouble figuring out, even after the first watch, like, what is Emily? Because she doesn't have footprints or footsteps. There's no sound when she walks, and yet she is killed later. So she's got to be somewhat alive. Yeah, because she does get killed. Depending on where you read, it's like the 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 explanation that I found that I was the most satisfied with is that she is essentially like this wandering hell soul thing that's just like warning her, but will unfortunately be dragged back into hell. Yeah. By, you know, as a result of warning her, because... Schweik was guarding the door so that they wouldn't open it, so that the dead wouldn't walk the earth. Uh, but then the stupid guys came down and killed him. <laughs> and so then it kind of became her job to keep doing it, I think. Again, this is where it's like if you drill too far into exactly what's going on plot wise, you find a lot of problems. Yeah. With it. Um, which is funny because they did have a continuity department in this movie. I looked it up because oh. I had to find out, like, did they <laughs> did they just, like, not have enough people working on this to figure all this shit out? But they did. Huh. So that seems to be what 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 her story is. Huh. And is that when they discover, the when Emily tells her about the book? Yes. I believe so. Yeah. I was confused because they show Emily at the beginning and then I assumed that Liza was the same person for the entire first part of this movie. <laughs> and then she showed up on the highway and I was like, oh, uh, okay. That's, they do look pretty similar with I their, can understand that, though. <laughs> feathered blonde hair. Yeah. This is so stupid. I'm sorry. I just cut you off. Nope. But, Go um, for it. I thought that they said that that man's name was John McCain. <laughs> And so I just decorated war me. hero yeah. Dr. John McCain. <laughs> I would love this movie even more if they wrote him into it. <laughs> They're like, what's going to appeal to Americans? Let's call him John McCain. <laughs> I don't know what his standing was in 1981. <laughs> I don't know if he was a maverick yet. <laughs> Now we're moving on to the next day, Liza ventures nervously into room 36 and a a dingy sheet, a bunch of dingy sheet covered furniture and shafts of dusty light. She finds an ancient book whose weird flesh like cover bears a single word, Eba. <laughs> Liza tries to shrug off her fears and strides into the bathroom only to be confronted with Schweik's rotting corpse nailed to the bathroom wall. <laughs> <laughs> she runs screaming from the discovery into the arms of the visiting John McCabe. The two of them return to the cursed room, but find nothing. Two nails are all that remain of Liza's nightmare vision. When Liza says she must have been overstimulated by Emily's tale, John queries her story by saying that there is no blind woman, li- blind woman living at the house that she described. So, yeah, this is a... Uh, a very cool nightmare sequence. I, th- I think it's the first time that we're treated to uh, Katriana McCall's awesome scream. Yeah. Because she, we get it a few more times, and I, I think several of the covers have stills of her of her doing like the a classic horror scream thing. And yeah, this is, it's like, it's another one of these things where you have these big chaotic tone shifts in the movie where it goes from like this kind of dreamy looking room to then like, something terrifying and then and then pulled right out of it and it was oh it was a dream or something yeah um yeah i got so psyched for this whole scene my notes are hell yeah and then the (laughs) quote i wanted to spare you but now i'll have to tell you everything i was like (laughs) tell me everything what's going on (laughs) and i really love there's like this really interesting shot going up the stairs and into room 36 and there's this weird like ghostly breathing like ambient noise the whole time yeah that was really cool 
Any other thoughts about this scene? Oh, I have a bunch. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I love that everyone in the hotel disappeared 60 years ago. That's kind of the plot of Disney World's Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. All right, oh, my people. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really liked the light. I just think this movie has such great, like, visual appeal and, like, a cool aesthetic. Because when um, Liza and Emily are talking about, like, the sort of backstory of this hotel, Liza's lit in this, like, really beautiful golden light. And then um, Emily is always framed in this, like, blue tone. So it, like, really sets up this, like, interesting dichotomy between the two characters. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, there's there were just a lot of really funny things. I love that she, one of them calls that like horrifying painting of all those dead bodies. Like in, she's like, "Oh, it's just an old painting." Like, That's all wha- it is. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's like a hundred dead people in this. What are you talking about? Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I just love the concept of like there's one room in the hotel you're not allowed to go in like it reminds me of the shining or mm-hmm. like 1408 or something like that's the evil room yep. and then of course this idiot just oh let me go up to room 36 and of course she finds something like horrific in there yeah right. I mean, the hotel is super huge there's way a ton of rooms to clean why do you have to run into that one first and even when like martha and arthur are cleaning in there it's like well why are we in this room but mm-hmm. I guess, honestly, as a human, when someone says, don't go in there, that's the first place I'm going. <laughs> you, you know? And when that thing keeps ringing and uh, uh, the, oh, I love the buzzer. That. Yes. You know, it's like there are all these things that are trying to lead her into that room. Mm-hmm. And it's like Emily is trying to keep her away from that, but is doing a bad job. Yeah. Well, well <sighs> sorry, go ahead. No, it, it's like the, the hidden room in Bluebeard's story, you know? No, I don't know this. Oh, Bluebeard? The, the 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 classic fairy tale horror story where a woman marries this guy, and he's super rich. <gasps> oh, okay. You know, and he says you you've got your run of everything, but don't ever go in this one room. Mm-hmm. And she finally does, mm-hmm. and uh, things don't go well. <laughs> but this <laughs> this also reminded me of the Sentinel, which is a fantastic old horror movie with Burgess Meredith. Oh, classic. And it has a very similar plot to this movie. And I just kept thinking back to that one all the time while I was watching Hmm. this. I only know that name from the Twilight Zone. What is the Sentinel? So it's set in New York City and a woman takes an apartment and people are really unusual that live in this building. It's an old brownstone. And... Even Burgess Meredith is kind of squirrely and odd. And it turns out that she, that the apartment building is blocking the gateway to hell. Oh. Right. <laughs> so it's, you know, if you substitute New Orleans for New York mm-hmm. and, um, you know, the fact that this is a, a brownstone apartment building instead of a hotel, yeah. it's, it's a very similar movie. Oh. Well, it's actually a very uh, different movie yes. <laughs> in so many, many ways. Right. Yeah. But the plot is very similar. <laughs> People well, sure do love Gateways to Hell. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe Burgess Meredith should have played the Emily role and just yelled out, You're a bum! <laughs> <laughs> You're a bum! <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe Emily would have, or um, Liza would have listened. <laughs> I have like truly no sympathy for Liza because there no, are so many dumb. outs. Like he's like, yeah, why don't you just not have this hotel? She's like, oh, because I'll have to do this other totally valid thing. She's like, don't go in room 36. She's like, I'm going there first thing, actually. Yeah. Like so so many instances where she could have saved herself. And she just yeah, <laughs> barrels no. right through. I didn't really think about it, but I didn't really have, I didn't, I think I said this towards the intro where I didn't really have like any feelings for any of the characters. So I wasn't upset when any of them died. I had no attachment to them. Um, I also, I didn't really have any sympathy for Liza, not for any particular reason. I was just like, yeah, she's there. Things are happening. Like I didn't have any for her whatsoever. (laughs) Like I didn't. I totally agree. And it's like, you don't really develop any strong attachment Mm -hmm. to any one person. You just kind of want to see them get ripped apart. (laughs) Yeah. In that special Fulci way. Exactly. (laughs) Layer after layer. Oh, the next scene. 
<laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> I felt a little bit bad for Emily when she's talking about like not wanting to go back. It's like, yeah, yeah I wouldn't want to go back to hell either. No. <laughs> and I did feel bad for um, Anna Green Gables because her but entire life chill. got ripped apart. Yeah, it sure did. <laughs> Literally. Um, yeah, <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> um, so after t- 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 after this, Liza goes for a walk around New Orleans with Martin Avery, and they happen upon an old bookshop. <laughs> 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 Just for a second, Liza spies a copy of the book Ebon in the window, but when she runs into the shop, the book is gone. The weird old bookseller tells her that he's never heard of that book by that name. And meanwhile, back at the hotel, Arthur is continuing his efforts to reseal the hole in the cellar wall that Joe unwisely breached, and he gets killed off by unseen ghouls. Um, <laughs> love the old kook in the bookshop. Yeah. yeah. Um, just giggling away. That book's been here for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> he, I think he might be one of the ones that is, he is not speaking English. <laughs> he is definitely speaking Italian, and they were like... This is yeah, this is his voice. This makes sense. Um, he cracks me up. And then the other note I have about these two scenes is they really got to stop going in that fucking basement. Yes. Nothing good comes from going into that basement. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, those are the only notes I have. If about. that were my house, I don't care what I invested in. I'm out of there. Yeah. It's like rotting, flowing water in your basement. Uh, it has to smell bad. Yeah. When I get a little bit of water in my basement, it smells bad. I mean, it's just sitting down there flowing and rotting. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> I also, it made me wonder about the history of if Martha and Arthur have been there so long, has this basement always been flooded? Has it always been an issue? Has it been a constant battle for them? And that's why, like, Arthur is attracted to go down there and still try to, even if Joe the plumber got wiped out first time he was down there. Right. You know? It's why Arthur is so weird and clammy. He, <laughs> he lives down there. <laughs> it, you know, he kind of reminded me of, it, like, X-Files, um, like a, a creature who would live in there. Yeah. And, you know? Yeah, and then he and then he shapeshifts back into person shape. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. That is what it reminded me of. Um, so um, then we move into a, a, a pretty incredible scene. <laughs> Martin goes on alone to visit a local library in search of original blueprints to the hotel. The strange librarian, played by director Lucio Fulci. Oh, leaves, oh really? Yep. Oh, my goodness. Leaves him alone, and he goes out to lunch. Just when Martin discovers a clue in the Seven Doors Hotel blueprints, a bolt of lightning from an unseen force of darkness knocks him off of a high ladder onto the floor, breaking his neck. I didn't get that from that. Then a horde of supernatural tarantulas appear and finish off the paralyzed Martin in a very gory way by eating his face. <laughs> Meanwhile, John investigates the house where Liza said that she met Emily, but he discovers only a blasted, decaying shell of a house, empty of clues except for one rotting item on the floor, the Book of Ebon. Um, the spider scene is its probably one of the most famous ones from this. It is really? the- Really? Yeah, because oh. it's so dumb. <laughs> It's so silly. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are, by my estimation, four real spiders and one very not real spider. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's um, also a really long scene. It yeah. goes it's on way too long. long. Like the slow motion of the spiders creeping up, and then yes. they just slowly tear his face apart. Yes. Um, Don't and they pull out his eyeball? They Yes, this is yeah. another instance. This is another, um, I have a little asterisk. More eyeball gore. Um, <laughs> Full is to eyeballs what Quentin Tarantino is to feet. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ripping them out. And then there's also like, there's like a weird emphasis on taking a bite out of its tongue, but just kind of taking a chunk and then leaving it. Yeah. Um, I also like some of the weird sound design stuff makes it seem like he thinks that spiders like shriek and yeah, gurgle like meow. and make noises <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> so loud. Yes. <laughs> These were the human voices I was hearing. I'm like, oh, humans are making little noises. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's like, are we supposed to think that that is the spider making that noise or is it just to make us go, ugh? Um, and it, then once again, we're treated to the music goes from the serious stuff into the funky stuff when it gets the <laughs> grossest, Yeah, which is just terrific. Did you guys catch that, that 
slight piercing sound when the spider goes through the tongue. Oh, yes. no. Yeah, it's, it's quiet, but yes. it's there. It's there. Yeah. yeah. I really like that. I like the scene a lot. I mean, it was cheesy and gross, but that was what, it was perfect for this movie. It totally worked. And I, there's not a lot of, like, body horror and body gore doesn't scare me, or it's not a turn off for me at all, like Blood and Guts. Um, but a creepy crawly spider, I do like the movie Arachnophobia. Whoa. Mm-hmm. I have to close my eyes sometimes. Um, so for here, I didn't close my eyes, but like a, a slowly crawling tarantula on a human, even like in Home Alone when the tarantula's there, I just, ew, I get a little bit like squeamish about it. Oh. So I really enjoyed like all of the spiders. I thought that was a good, as someone who doesn't scare easy, I was just like, okay, yeah, spiders, that's cool. Yep. Huh. So that's Me interesting. too. I know, it's weird. Yeah. No, this, it's... I thought this was a great scene. I really yeah. enjoyed it, even though it was very cheesy and not real looking. You shouldn't um, reach over to the side when you're on a ladder. Yeah. That's no. just, everybody knows that. Well, he also probably wasn't expecting the indoor lightning. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> <laughs> but it only happens when he's, he just he looks in the book and he sees the blueprint and the discovery and he's like, aha! And then he immediately is bolted back. So some force like right. threw him away off there. But then also when he's on the ground and he's dead, the, you zoom into the book and then it disappears. It disappears. The blueprint illustration of this Oh really? It, it disappears. In a series oh, of like four little blur cut things, like it mm-hmm. the the blueprint goes away. Oh, so it's erased by yeah. the spider. So that when the doctor or Mister <laughs> Librarian Fulci Director Man comes back from his lunch break, <sighs> and he finds this guy's, you know, he just sees a book with an empty page of just like oh the hotel or whatever. Nothing fishy yeah. about that. Oh, at all. something made his face. Oh well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, where did the spiders come from? Under how the were, shelves. But how are they related to, are they related to like this curse hell gate? Didn't you see the cataracts on all the spider's eyes? Oh. Right, 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 right. Wait, are you serious? Like no. Zillion eyes. No, I, no, I literally, like I'm like, but what, they just came out, he fell down and they came out of nowhere. Yeah. And I think ate this him is up. like an example of like, now that the gate is open, just hell is spilling out yep. everywhere in the hell town. Hell is breaking it's the... spiders and zombies with <laughs> just like head wounds. There should have been way more things coming out of hell then besides... It's true. Um, it's true. Anyways, but this made for a cool scene. And it's also some... If you wanted to have something tearing apart somebody's face, because no other humans are in the room. And if you wanted another gory scene where someone's eyeball is getting pulled out... You can't have a rap. I guess you could have a dog with that's in another scene. You, if you wanted to have another <laughs> animal or entity, like a living thing, tearing apart a dead body, this made sense. Plus, like, spiders are, you know, supposed to be scary or spooky than, you know, could yeah. be worms or snakes. And I mean, that immediately would make the audience probably revolt to be like, oh, gross spiders. Yeah. And like, you know, and then you have the anticipation of just watching them slowly go across. It's, it's, yeah, yeah it's a, it's a it's a very silly scene that makes me laugh every time I see it. But now that I understand through the lens of like of looking at the um, all the different notes about it, that it's like, oh, this is just supposed to be something coming through the gate. Yeah. yeah. And we haven't figured that out yet as an audience, and we don't really. Yeah. But well, here's a question I have for you. So in this movie, the moments where there is somebody, usually it's their face or a part of their body, being ripped open or torn apart and like blood and guts. They are close up, so, so close up. They're fierce zoom-ins. Can you imagine being in a theater with a giant screen that is just this giant lash from a, the chain oh. or here where it's just a man's face and tongue? And there are other movies that have close-ups, but here just about every that you know intense body horror like flesh being ripped apart yeah it's so close up and i didn't think about that till right now and i really want to see it on the big screen because that would be really cool we'll that have to see cool. if they'll play it at henry ford imax i bet they would i would i would love to see that yeah. <laughs> they, i bet they would say no <laughs> well that's we need to put that on our field trip list that's where yeah. our field trip wish list after yeah. we go to space we'll go yeah. to oh, that's right. the imax yeah. theater <laughs> I pit bet. stop I bet if they're doing a re-release that there will probably be screenings somewhere of it. Because I would really love to cool. see this in a theater. It would just be fun. And I would love to see the way that other people react Oh, to yeah. It. And this is one that gets will get reactions. You bet. Yeah. <laughs> this is random, but um, I did like seeing the real tarantulas. <laughs> but um, <laughs> when I was in elementary school, my class went to like some museum or zoo or something and they had tarantulas out and we learned so much about them that like 
I had trouble getting into the scene in particular <laughs> because tarantulas don't eat people. Wait, like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what you are you telling me that this might not be factually correct? <laughs> <laughs> My Impossible. brain just like could not get over it. Like humans are way too big. They are like they um like meat. But the thing that kind of um got to me was in this field trip, we learned that um, some types of tarantulas have these little like bristly hairs that cause like a irritation or like a rash. And so if we wanted to pet the tarantula on this field trip, we had to wear like little um, latex gloves mm. so that our hands wouldn't get affected by these little bristle hairs. So the idea of this tarantula crawling across this guy's face and just like those bristles rubbing against his face as his face is getting like eaten, mm-hmm. ugh, it made it worse, I think. <laughs> so cool. Thank you, Ann Arbor Public Schools. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shoot. Wow, I'm glad you guys like that scene. I was like, this is where they're going to shut it off. Like, no, right. I was engrossed. Good. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm glad. So meanwhile, the semi-sinister Emily returns to her house, which magically appears with all the posh furniture again that was seen during <laughs> Liza's visit. But then she is visited by emotionless but menacing figures of the recently dead, Arthur, Joe, Marianne, and Schweik. Despite her pathetic pleas to be allowed to stay in the land of the living, she's called back to hell, for she apparently has served her purpose. Emily orders her guide dog, Dickie, into action, who attacks the rotting cadaver of Spike <laughs> in a scene that looked like it might have actually been dangerous. For a, wh- for a while, it seems like Emily's dog's val- valiant efforts might actually save her. But with a mesmerizing stare from Spike to the dog and in a moment of devilish duplicity Dickie turns on Emily herself ripping out her throat mm. in, an, in another scene of blood and gore <laughs> bad dog yeah Dickie Dickie's a hellhound now I didn't I didn't pick up on like this this write up is interesting I didn't pick up on it being like just a look from from Spike being like oh that's what that's what changed it I figured it was like oh he bit him and got infected by him or something I don't know the but the dog yeah, this is a cool scene, though. <clears throat> it's really cool. And it has a lot of really neat lighting. Everybody's lit very well. Somehow, Schweik got over there without anybody noticing him on the street. Um, and uh, yeah. yeah, this is a very cool scene. And the the throat rip is pretty great, although she's making a lot of normal noise for somebody that's getting her throat ripped out by mm-hmm. a dog. <laughs> yeah, it is a cool scene, though, and it is... This is like one of the first times where you see a bunch of, I know we saw a bunch of dead bodies in the morgue on slabs, but this is sort of like those bodies are here now, mm-hmm. or some of two of them anyway. And they're I like thought it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. that was, and I was, in a, I almost paused it, but I didn't because I wanted to be like, exactly who is it and how many? Are there six? Is it important? I was like, it doesn't matter who's here. Just they're here and they're bad things are happening. The important right. thing is she is surrounded by mm-hmm. them. Yeah, yeah. My, my favorite scene in this entire movie is when she's like, answer me, I know you're there. And then she drops out of frame and that guy's right behind her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you just realize, shit, she can't see them. Yep. She can't see yeah. any of them. Yeah. And they're covering this house. They're yeah. everywhere. Yep. And I really like that where she couldn't see and she's like, who's there? She knows something's there. Yeah. And she gets, and we get these awesome close-ups of all of them. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I expected something at the end of this scene. I did not see the throat rip coming Mm -hmm. up. Yeah. 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 Well, and also at this point in this scene, I was still confused slash curious as to how Emily with the white eyes, how she differed from these other undead people. Mm -hmm. And so then when she has her dog attacking them, that for me, that separated her from them. And I wrote a little, this is not a perfect quote, but she says something like, I don't want to go back. Don't torment me. Leave me in peace. I did what I had been asked. So it made me curious as to what her role in the, in hell or whatever place that she came from that, how does it relate to like the other undead? Like she had been given a task and she was trying to undo and protect Liza. And she, yeah, she wanted to be protected from these, these zombie things. Right. We need the prequel. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. That's right. Going. Not going to happen. It's simple, she said. <laughs> Is, are the other two um, <laughs> movies in this series at all related or not no. really? Okay. They share a lot of the same actors and stuff, but like the stories are all absurd and different and they don't, re- <laughs> there's no through line other than it was just like, I'm making these movies. Uh, but it's still a trilogy? It's considered a trilogy because they came out in close succession. And I think if I remember correctly, I think at least one of them even borrows mu- uh, music cues from this huh. and it, which is weird because there's I so closely associate them with this movie that they feel out of place okay in the other ones but um and I I personally think this is far and away the best of the three but if you enjoyed this like the, the there's a lot to enjoy in those too because it's kind of the same thing they don't make any sense it's a bunch of cool special effects you will never be able to piece it together what's happening. <laughs> I saw a lot of people agreeing with that. Yeah. That this one is the best of the three. It online. is. It's the one that has, it's the one that has like kind of a coherent and cool story. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, the, and yeah, this is the first time that, that we, you know, when she says that thing about like, I did what I was asked, like, you know, she, she's mm-hmm. completed her task or whatever. It's the first time that you're kind of given Mm-hmm. Whatever her purpose is, yeah. other than just being spooky looking. Because you think about it earlier and wonder, like, if Jill, the little girl, if she has the white eyes, how does she get them versus Emily? And, like, why is she not in the hotel being scary in the base? So, but this was the first scene where you start to, there's more evidence that she is a completely separate thing. Right. Um, yeah. This is the first scene where, he, at least I was like, oh, there's something bigger going on in the background that the audience just doesn't know about. Like someone is pulling the string. Someone gave her this task. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, because she was speaking out loud thinking that whoever was there was hearing her. You know, like right. I did what I was asked. Stop this. Like, don't don't kill me. Yeah. Um, I, so, was, I was really happy because I was 100% sure that Dickie was a goner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yep. And then he turned around and yeah. he, he did what he did, but at least I didn't have to watch this dog die. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of expected them to mutilate the dog, honestly. Yeah, I did too the first time I saw it, and that honestly would have made me not like the movie very much. I yeah. always think that's a really cheap choice to upset your audience. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, I agree. And so I'm glad. I don't mind watching people get ripped apart for whatever yeah. reason. But, <laughs> but nobody but, wants to watch a dog. No. You know, In this movie, it does not happen, y'all. So. No, Dickie's um, a hero Just humans. In a way. Just beautiful humans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but so in this, before this, Joe also goes, Martha. the doctor. Oh. The doctor goes back to the house. John McCain. John McCain. John McCain. <laughs> yes. The guy. Maverick. The guy goes, the guy, right. Burt Reynolds goes back to the house. <laughs> he's looking for, and he finds the book mm-hmm. and he knows to go to room number 36 and then he goes back to the morgue and that's how we get him back to the morgue. Right. And he finds that symbol, whatever that symbol is on the wall. Yeah. We find it on um, the old Schweik guy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that I, was also important to kind of tie things. And we're almost to the end of the movie, so this right. is where it's all coming together. Right, it's all starting to come um, together. And this is, you're treated to another, I, when he finds that book, you're treated to another one of those things where he's going, my goodness, it's almost like a gateway to, and then something <laughs> bashes in the room. It's like he almost gets there, yeah, but then he yeah. doesn't, but just shy. Well, at, at one point, John is doubting Liza. That's in the, he, in the next okay. sequence. Um, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> oh, real quick. Yeah. I, I'm i not sure, but I believe the bathtub scene is before this, when it's full of water and Martha goes upstairs. To unclog it. Probably, because yeah. we're almost done. Something's right. clogging. It happens tub. around this point. Because I had a note where I was just like, would any of you reach into that fucking no! tub? Oh, oh no. is, is Joe the one in the bathtub? Yes, that's when Joe. <laughs> yes, that's when Joe comes out, and his body is normal, but his face is not. Yeah. <laughs> but is Joe the one? Like she goes in there, pulls the plug, and is that Joe's body in there? Yes. Oh, and that's how she ends up being killed, and then she's in the circle that's at. Um, yeah, the, whoever put this synopsis together had it a little bit backwards. But when they're when they're all menacing Emily, okay. it's like that's why she's there because she gets killed by Joe. After she okay, because I have a note. The there's a really cool, and I didn't remember who. 
I didn't remember that it was in the bathroom and I didn't remember whose hands it was, but there was a cool scene where there was a woman's hands mm -hmm. and she was looking through her hands. Yes. Um, to see dead Joe's face. Right. And so I guess it was her Martha's hand seeing when she was finding him. But I, that was a really cool shot. Again, really, really cool yeah. shots. It's, it's a, different things. It's a very cool shot. But if you look at where her hands are in the scene before it, they're like up on her forehead. <laughs> you're, you're killing my vibe over no, here. No, no, no. I'm <laughs> just right? saying it is a very cool scene. I didn't notice that until I was reading the goofs section um oh. for this movie <laughs> so no it's a very cool shot and like i that sequence is great even though joe is distractingly very clean for being with again that, so. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well his, his wife, wife him up his a wife, little bit yeah oh yeah she, and she did a great job and, he's and his incision suit. really healed really yeah. well yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um all right yeah, why would he, if he didn't have an autopsy yeah why was he cut I don't know. Or maybe Just he had the fun. autopsy, but Schweik, <laughs> the other body didn't have maybe autopsy. Maybe did, Schweik did something that we didn't see or something. He's like, I ripped your eye out, and then ah, I'm going to fuck yeah. your shoulder up. Why did that lonely ass man stay in the room with all those corpses after the main doctor guy left? <laughs> it's his job. Well, and normally you work in a morgue and you're surrounded by dead bodies all the time and it's no big deal. So why right. would this be a big deal? I wouldn't hang out with him, though. I'd get a coffee or something. Might be his thing. Wasn't his time. The well, doctor was on break. <laughs> yeah. Let's hook this ancient corpse up. Yeah. yeah. And see if... <laughs> I got this new computer. I want to try it on this thing. Yeah. I want to try it on the grossest thing here. Also, that thing had to, like, smell and be totally decayed and disgust. It, it yep. was... It's from nineteen twenty-seven. Pretty well preserved and dry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been, like, uh, 60 years or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So back at the Seven Doors Hotel, Liza is suffering a supernatural assault <laughs> during a visit to the cellar. John arrives from the hospital just in time to save her, but then accuses Liza of being in league with the forces of darkness. <laughs> <laughs> just as John reveals from his research of the Book of Ebon, which he brought with him, that the hotel is one of the seven gates of hell, a sudden storm erupts and, con and confides... What? A sudden storm erupts in the confides of the flooded cellar. As they flee to John's car and drive away, the hotel is seen lurking with the undead. The gates of hell have finally been opened. Um, this scene is funny. There are howling wolves in the middle of the day, which I guess is a, a hell portal thing. Um, and, oh, also, <laughs> when he was working on the, the zombie guy in the morgue, no mask. Yeah. Weird that I don't know why why that was the case, but um and also seemingly just saying one of the gateways to hell was like the thing that made that weird storm start happening <laughs> to them. Yeah. So apparently that's the thing that opens it up. I did really like the um uh like that storm in the basement when they're both kind of just standing on that plank of wood, which yep. is mm -hmm. for some reason down there. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was a really cool visual. Very. It's mm -hmm. very cool. And again, they're in that fucking basement and they got to stay out of there. Oh, man. There's also that good jump scare with Arthur coming out of the water. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mm -hmm. thought that Arthur was the doctor for some reason. Like, all of these white mm. men look exactly they the same the to same. me. It's I can't fair. tell the women look the same on. and so do the men. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's fair. What struck me is that in one of these scenes right around this point, John is arguing with Liza saying, no, no, you made all this up in this book. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. You're deranged on and on. And immediately after that, he starts quoting yes. from the book. <laughs> yeah. Right. He does the, he does the classic, like, you're nuts <laughs> yeah. thing. Who are you, Liza? <laughs> yeah. And yet he's still dragging his ass over to that house to look for the book exactly. by himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unasked. Yeah. And actually, at one point when he's doing that, when he's doing that whole thing where he's calling her nuts, his New Zealand accent bleeds through just a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> no, but I liked, I liked that scene. They're in the hospital and they go down the stairs and then they're in the basement. I thought that was really cool. It made me question how many doors were actually opened and how they did that. Yeah. Wait, wasn't that, that happens That's at the end. later. That's where at the we end. At? Are we still in the basement? We're still, we haven't we gone haven't, to the morgue yet? We haven't yeah. gone back to the morgue and we okay. haven't had the, the, all the slow zombies and the bad shooting again. Um, we're, we're just about there though. Oh, they have to leave the basement to go to the morgue to go back to the basement. Right. Yeah. right. When they leave for the morgue, I really love the shot where they leave and all the lights are on in the house and you can see all the people mm -hmm. walking around, mm -hmm. all it's, the dead people. It's funny, you've, you were talking about the Haunted Mansion earlier. That was a scene, that was a thing that was just like, oh, that seems like it would be like a Disney World thing, <laughs> like, like, at, like a Haunted Mansion thing. Because it's just cool. You just suddenly see all these mm -hmm. these silhouettes and shadows walking around the house and 
that's when you know, like, oh, shoot, the dead are going to, the dead are walking the earth. Because there's some, I think when he's reading something from the book, they're talking about how the dead will walk the earth. And yeah. that's the first, that's when we first see it happening. And it's almost a direct quote from Dawn of the Dead. Yeah. Oh, really? That's right. immediately what I thought of. Yeah. 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 Some of the imagery looked kind of the same a little bit later when the uh, zombies are walking around the morgue. It's like mm-hmm. this This is very a very similar aesthetic, yep. I think. It was within a year or two of that, right? Because what mm-hmm. year was Dawn of so the Dead? So Dawn of the Dead was 78. Yeah. 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 So this yeah. was just a probably shot in 80. So they were like, let's do that. That yeah. worked. <laughs> well, if they added the zombie stuff later, I mean, there's no way you can't. Yeah. Be inspired. Yeah. Or influenced. Exactly. And unsee what you've seen. Once they get to the morgue, I think I have a note here where John McCain says, no, Liza, I'm a doctor. And I wrote, this man is an absolute ass. I cannot stand (laughs) this guy. He says that, and then he produces the biggest fucking hand cannon (laughs) gun out of his desk for some reason. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm a doctor, and he just yeah. has this giant gun with endless bullets. Oh, the, the, you well, mean this? Well, he wastes yeah. some. Right, yeah, that he fires like nine times uh, before <laughs> he, there's, there's a, before we get into the rest of the scene, there's a funny goof that I didn't notice. Um, obviously, like, he's firing the gun way more than six times. I think he gets nine shots off before there's a brief oh. scene where he's trying to reload the mm-hmm. revolver, and that was done as a joke. And you can see, um, you can see Liza's like the actress starting to laugh before they cut away because <laughs> oh it wasn't written God. into the script to to reload. Uh, I think the idea was like, "Hey, this is absurd. How have I fired so many shots? Why this thing only shoots six? So there mm-hmm. is a little. I didn't catch that this time, but I was going to go back and watch that. Just again. dropping them in the barrel. The yeah, gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Backwards, too, apparently. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, He's a doctor. What m- more do you expect from this man? It's not a marksman. <laughs> I do wish that one thing that, like, when they're driving to the hospital, and I know that it's, it's, there's even a line about how it's desolate and there's no one out. It's, I wish that they had more budget so that there could be more zombies and more horrific things happening around the city instead of it just being desolate. But I know that this was shot for pretty I like, cheap. I, I think that would have been cool, but I also really like how you're in the hospital and it's so quiet. And yeah. I did not expect that many like reanimated b- bodies to be there in the hospital. So that was a little, that was a nice little surprise for me. I mean, yeah. it makes sense, but I enjoyed that it was that creepy quietness of being in the, like, why is nobody here? Mm-hmm. Like they were asking that. I was asking that. Yeah. And I did like how all of these bodies came out of nowhere and were just there and walking around. Yeah, it and really, if that would have happened in the streets right before it, I feel like it would have been less impactful. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think I agree with that. This yeah, part true. reminded me of a book that I read in high school by Christopher Pike called *Whisper of Death*, mm-hmm. and um, basically towards the end of the, uh, these teenagers are being chased by a witch or something, and so they get in a car and they try to get the hell out of Dodge. They're just trying to drive out of town, and they realize that. Um, like this witch has taken like a, a glass cup and put it over the map of the town. And because she's done that, there is a barrier around the town where they cannot escape. Mm. Like there's a physical barrier. Mm-hmm. So they drive their car and the car just stops and mm-hmm. they can't get any farther out of town because they have been trapped mm. inside of the Force town. Field. It gave me the same sort of vibe where... The second that they leave the house and they see no one in town, I was like, they are trapped. There's no escape. They're not going to be able to go anywhere. There's no one who can help them. Like That's good. It's over. I would have thought There's nothing more they can do. Mm. They're already trapped. No matter what they do, it's over. That's cool. I definitely am stuck in the like, well, they just didn't have enough money to make it. It's cooler. <laughs> like, I'm stuck, always stuck in that way of watching it. I wish I had that kind of imagination, I guess. <laughs> Um, but it also ties into when they are suddenly back, mm-hmm. they never could have left in the first place. They're, mm-hmm. they're trapped. Right. It's like when they, it's like when they actually opened it and they were hit with all the portal wind, they were actually like in hell or yeah. something, but we just don't know that That's yet. where it ended. Yes. Because yeah. mm-hmm. we got to spend 15 minutes showing you some, okay, zombies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Know, they're, they're okay. Um, you know, he, my God, he shoots 
how many of them in the chest, arm, stomach, and then eventually in the... I, that happened, I don't well, know how many times. After the first headshot, I was sure he'd learned his lesson. Yes. Yeah. And then he goes... <laughs> It goes back to more shots to the chest, and I'm and the arm. That's yeah. the other. One. Yeah. That's funny. he's a pretty good shot, maybe. Yeah, but because it looks like he's aiming for the chest yeah. and the arm, but it's like, no, come on, yeah, you and got it. They're not even attempting to leave. He's just I standing know. there, like yeah, blowing yeah. them away. It's and like, he doesn't have enough bullets to kill all of these people that are already dead anyway. Can't you? The bullets are they supposed to work on these people anyway? Yeah, like. They're also, he's also just shuffling back and forth in this weird <laughs> little, like, it's not even a hallway. It's like a room between rooms that he's shooting all of these zombies through the broken windows. And then one of my favorite deaths happens, oh, which yes. is his morgue buddy. Yes. <laughs> he weirdly shoots a window that explodes. And then all of the glass kills him. It flies back into his face. It is so cool. It's very cool. I watched that scene several times because I was thinking, is he shooting at it on purpose or did it just happen? I couldn't quite tell. He just loses it and shoots it. <laughs> right. It doesn't make any sense. And that's how glass flies. It flies directly back at you. It flies back, yeah. It if we shot like the window in here, we would all be in trouble. <laughs> no, that was a very cool death scene. And I, th if I remember correctly, there's a there is a impa like a glass impaling thing similar to that in the original Suspiria. So I bet that the oh. I bet that 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 effects person was just like, I can give you that. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make any sense in your movie, but I can give you the exact same fucking thing. We'll just yeah. kill this guy with it. It's in the beginning of Suspiria. Yeah, that's what I thought. Right with the stained glass, and it looks a lot better yeah. in that. <laughs> but. There were a couple things that reminded me of Suspiria, mostly the use of color. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's like an Italian horror thing or like a giallo thing or what, but mm -hmm. yeah, it did remind me of that a few times. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, well, Suspiria was 77, mm -hmm. so this is all yep. going on. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and there there are a lot of like through lines between the Italian horror movies in terms of style and color choice and camera mm -hmm. movement and all that. And then in a lot of cases, just people that are working on the movies, um, gotcha. even though apparently they're, they were rivals or something. <laughs> but I also like when um, Liza is like uh, pulled backwards, like the window explodes behind her and she's pulled back. I was 100% expecting it just because of the way the camera was framed, but it was... Still cool. I still liked it. Very cool. And that was, um, they, one of the posters is that image. It's like a, an illustrated version of that image where she does that and that great scream. And there's a bunch of hands reaching for her through ah. this glass, um, in a scene that, yeah, yeah, that's, it is great. It also is agonizingly slow when you watch it. It's just yeah. like, they're just kind of holding her. And, and some of the guys look look fine. They don't look, they, you know, they're just moving slow. They don't have like gaping head wounds. There's just a couple of guys in the back that are like, oh, I'm just here. I'm here too. And I'm tired. I love that they have matching jammies. They all have good jammies. Yes. <laughs> were, were they all like patients? I'm they guessing that's what it was. Yeah. It's like, Damn, this hospital sucks. This hospital sucks. They lose people constantly, <laughs> including all of the orderlies. But also, like if we were if we were back in the previous scene where they were in the basement and they opened up the gate. Mm -hmm. So is it like an alternate dimension of existing? Like is everybody who was once alive in the other pre hell world where they now they're dead? So everybody who's in the hospital just as a patient is now like dead in the zombie? Maybe. I think maybe that's why she was being cautioned, like, don't open that fucking door because we'll all go to hell or something. Maybe. Again, this is where it's like, if you drill down too far. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. It <laughs> yeah. Doesn't, it does not. I don't care where they came from. Yeah. Don't I need to know. I did have questions about that because I totally thought this was like a different dimension or something once they opened the gate. But then that orderly and Jill show up. And I was like, well, yes. wait a second. Uh, yes. So, and that, that's, yeah, uh, Jill's there, a fresh horde of revived corpses. John begins shooting the zombies. And then amidst all of that, he shoots Jill in the head and her head blows the fuck up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jill's having a really hard couple yeah. of days. <laughs> well, it makes sense that Jill's there because apparently at the funeral when we saw her white eyes, we right. knew something was not right with her. Right. And so later on, we were seeing the 
the previous undead people that we saw before, like we saw Arthur in the basement or so it makes sense that Jill is there. Right. I still don't know why Jill exists in this whole movie. Yeah. I don't really understand anything, but it make I didn't question why she was there. I'm mean, of course she's there. They were like, let's let's have an effect where we kill a kid. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't kill the dog, we're killing the kid. Does it matter? Uh, well, should we write a story for her? Yeah. I want Jill's movie. Just have her there. I want I know. Jill's movie, yeah. man. Yeah. There's a close up of Liza's eyes at some point in this, and I loved it. It's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's like shot in a blue light. She is like, doesn't she have blue? She has really light colored eyes mm-hmm. at this point. Of her, I just thought it was really striking. Of her real eyes? Of her real eyes, yeah. Yep, that's uh, telling you what's coming up next. Yeah. So. What's next is a final appearance from the spectacularly rotted corpse of Schweik, <laughs> who drives the terrified couple down a spiral staircase into what should be a hospital basement, but to their utter bewilderment, they find themselves back in that fucking cellar at the Seven Doors Hotel, following a bright light emanating from a cloud of smoke. Don't go into the light. <laughs> Carol Ann. They walk, <laughs> <laughs> they walk through the large hole in the wall and into a landscape of death depicted in the Warlock's painting. Each Oops. horizon offering, <laughs> oopsie! <laughs> Each horizon offering the same view of dead bodies scattered everywhere amongst the arid landscape. The portal behind them closes, and there's no escape. They are trapped in the beyond, apparently for all eternity. And there we are. The beyond. They're yeah. in hell. Yeah. That ending is so cool. I had such a big smile on my face yep. once they were in the basement again. It's like, oh, this is so cool. This is, I don't know what the hell this means. Yeah. It <laughs> doesn't matter. That's what's neat about it. That ending is is truly what made me love this movie. Because the first time I saw it, I was like, this is fine. This is, I'm enjoying myself. But that ending is so cool. And it's so bleak. And just showing them, like... David Warbeck, that actor, makes a particularly horrified face yes, with his eyes. Yes. That is maybe the best acting in the movie. Yes. Um, in an otherwise, ro- like, he doesn't really offer much to the role <laughs> otherwise, other than that. Um, but he actually looks horrified. And she's just kind of blank. Yeah. But, I don't know. We all react to going to hell differently. Yeah. <laughs> go to hell. Yeah. There's no <laughs> one right, right way to go to hell. Um. Yeah, I love his face, and he just has, like, this look of, like, like dawning understanding and total horror. But I like that you see that from him, and then you see her 100% blank expression. Because um, it, it, it's just such a, like, emotional ending. Like, it's all about feeling. And you have this nightmare ending where it doesn't make sense. Suddenly, you're back where you started, and you don't know how you got there. And then they turn around nothing behind them. They turn around again, nothing behind them. They turn around one more time and they start running for an exit and their eyes immediately. It's just, it's perfect. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. And it's got that really awesome piece of music that starts really slow and nice. We've heard it a couple of times at this point in the movie, but we get this like swelling orchestral version with all this like choral arrangement in it as they're realizing they're in hell and, and then the titles roll. Yeah. It's such a cool ending. It's it's what really it honestly raises the movie like a whole letter grade. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, for absolutely. Me. Like easily. Yeah. Just that last minute. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit too of In the Mouth of Madness because every time they try to drive out of town, they end up right back where they started from. And with that last scene of them looking and looking and also with going down the spiral staircase and they end up someplace completely different mm-hmm. back in the hotel, in the basement, it's like they're trapped. You yep. just can't escape mm-hmm. now. No escape. Yep. Yeah, Love I like it. that a lot. Because as soon as they went to the basement where they, you knew it was over. Like you, yeah. it was really good. I thought it was a really, really great ending. And I already was liking the movie. Like I didn't have a problem with the movie whatsoever. Um, I know when we kind of talked a little bit about, like for the orphanage, I was I didn't really enjoy the movie very much. But once we sort of started wrapping up the ending, that's when I really started to like it a lot because it just all came for me. Um, but for this movie, I the great the movie the ending did elevate it even further. But I was already like enjoying the movie as it was. But the and I think since we were not supposed to fully understand everything, and I did not struggle with not knowing what was going on in the movie. Um, but I did feel like it was a great little wrap up. Yep. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, you're trapped in hell. So are we, we're all here together 
and our, you know, I just, it was a really, really great ending. And I did like the way it went back and you saw the painting that was drawn at the beginning. Like that's yeah. how it opened was that painting. And I still didn't understand what that painting was all about. Like in, every time the painting was shown in the movie, I didn't understand the colors of the landscape, why it looked like sand or why was it like beige? Like it just seemed kind of like moonscapey to me. Yeah. Um. So I liked, they. it literally faded into the painting. I thought that was just so atmospheric and beautiful and just a great ending. Yep. And what a particularly horrible vision of hell, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There are no fires. It's just desolate, so empty with dead bodies scattered around mm -hmm. and that's it, just forever. Yeah. yeah. But what, I don't want to know, like, their eyes were white, their eyes turned white. And one of the things I was reading was explaining that perhaps this is a form of purgatory. Mm. That could, Yeah, that could be. It's like they never explicitly, s well, yeah. I read that too. Um, but again, I wasn't trying to like figure it out. I just. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. funny because, yeah, I don't, under I don't understand the ending scene, but like the feeling of it, I was like, oh, I know exactly. Like I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Like it's over. They can't do anything. It was very satisfying. It was yeah. very. I was. I didn't leave the leave the leave the theater like being like, what the hell? <laughs> there. Why did they go there? And I didn't. Leave. I was just like, yep, that was. Yep, it ended, and that was it. Yeah. It wasn't like I had to like immediately like text Dallas and be like, oh my god, what's going on? Because <laughs> it would just made sense. It made sense in its own way, yeah. which is you have to credit like the writers and the director for doing that because like you're not supposed to understand and you right. Know? Yeah. It's it yeah, very well done. I think it frustrates me when people dismiss the entire genre of horror movies and they say, "Oh, I don't like horror." It's like, look at the range of movies we've covered just in the last five or six episodes mm -hmm. of yeah. this. Yeah, everything from, you know, the orphanage to this movie. I mean, that's even just those two movies. That's a mm -hmm. Huge range <laughs> of different uh, ideas that are evoked and different ways of filming. And so, so much is packed into all of these. Yeah. I think this movie is really original, though. There were so many, like, I've watched so many horror movies over the past year. And you get sort of sick of it because you see, oh, yeah, this reminds me of a, this exact scene from this other thing. Mm -hmm. But there were so many scenes in this where I was like, wow, mm -hmm. I've never seen this before or anything close to it. And especially this ending scene, like, name another movie that's like this. I can't. Mm -hmm. Although I haven't seen Only, In the Mouth of Madness. I was going to say. <laughs> I got a free shutter oh. trial just Let's, to watch it. <laughs> and then it left like two days later. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think the closest thing in terms of a bleakness ending is The Mist. Oh, I, I, the ending of the movie. Yes. The, the movie. The yeah, novella right. is a different ending. I haven't gotten to that yet. Oh. I'm it's, very excited. It's wonderful. But I will say that... Um, you know, Stephen King is not a huge fan of some of the adaptations of his work. <gasps> yes. He said that <laughs> the ending of The Mist, he thinks, improves on his yes. ending. Yes, I, I read that somewhere. But I think the ending, because I've only seen the movie too, and I think I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't compare it to the ending of this of The Stand or oh, The I Mist. Just, yeah, I just mean in terms of like a, a bleak the feeling. ending. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, though that was brutal though. That ending was tough. Oh, yeah. But, um... Much tougher <laughs> than this one is, but um, this was like this was almost a happy ending, in a way. Yeah. It, in what way? It ends all <laughs> well. There's there's no spiders down there. I mean, as perfectly, <laughs> it was perfectly resolved. It was resolved as much as it could have been, I suppose. Right. Knowing yeah. that where they were, their eyes turned white. They were in that painting, or they were in whatever. Right. Purgatory hell. Vike stops showing up, all yeah. gross, <laughs> wearing his suit. I don't remember what he was. Wearing. I don't know. Yeah. I'm still, and I'm not a huge zombie, like I've seen plenty of zombie movies, I'm not a huge fan of zombie movies. I don't no. seek them out. And honestly, when these, I didn't really think about the dead bodies being zombies until I saw them in mass in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Even when they were in Emily's house and she was, they were killing her or whatever, I still didn't view them as zombies, quote unquote. In my mind, it was, I was trying to think of a more highbrow or like, other term for these undead beings right. because I still don't know how Emily was separate from them. Like I wouldn't have viewed her as that versus them. 
But once they were all walking so slowly with their head down in the hospital, I was like, oh, there's zombies. Why? Yeah. But yeah. I didn't see them. And honestly, if you what what is the definition of a zombie? If it's like an undead person, that's what the other people were earlier, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were animated dead people. I don't know. But just seeing them in mass, I was just like, you know, eye rolling, tropey, tropey. Because yep. I don't personally <laughs> enjoy that. That um, those oh, types of horror movies and yeah. zombie movies, and they've been done to um, death. Yeah, so yeah. It's... But I mean, it worked for this, and it, you know, it made for us like some cheesy, like let's shoot the zombie with a gun. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I, I do agree with you. When they were all um, like filling the house, when Emily was running around with Dicky, um, I don't know if you guys have seen Hell House LLC, but it gave me similar vibes to the. I want to say it's a mannequin. It had like a very similar feel. And so I was kind of surprised when they were um, sort of more typical zombies later in the movie as well. Yeah. Well, should we get to our final thoughts overall on the movie and and then and do our rankings? Yeah. Cool. I love this movie. I wasn't scared by it at all, but <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting and really different from what I have seen, which is quite a few titles by this point. Sure. Um, so, scare ranking, I'm going to go with a, a one. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. But, um, I think I want to go with a nine for the Ooh, overall movie. Wow. I really enjoyed this movie. All right. Um, yeah, I just, I thought it was, I mean... <laughs> It's not a perfect movie by any means, but so much of it worked for me. Um, yeah, I, I just really enjoyed this. I thought it was awesome. And I especially love um, the visual aesthetic of it. I just thought it was interesting and unique. All right. Well, I I really enjoyed the movie. It's not my favorite. I don't think I need to watch it again. Um, I loved so much. I love the the gore. I love the the. <laughs> the terrible and amazing practical effects. I love the close-ups of it very much. I like the cinematography. I like some of the unique shots, the music. I thought it was really... Uh, you could have made this very badly, and it could have stayed very badly, and nobody would have wanted to watch it. But this had just the amount of you know, campiness and imperfection where it made it more like endearing or interesting to watch. And I liked that I didn't have to or didn't want to figure out what was going on, and I was just enjoying the world that they were in. I was not very afraid. I mean, I don't want to give anything a zero. I'll give it a one out of five <laughs> on the uh, scarometer. Um, once I got past that first close-up of the skin being torn by the chain, I was like, oh, this is what we're doing. Yep, I'm here for this. <laughs> so I was, I like that a lot. Uh, for the ranking for the movie total, uh, I guess I'll give it a six out of ten. Um, for no particular reason, I just, yeah, I feel like it's a six out of ten. I thought it was really great. Um, it just, I haven't seen a lot of like Italian horror movies, and I really, I didn't know any of the actors or any of the story or anything behind it. And usually, when I'm going to watch a movie, I know a little bit more. But for this assignment, I was like, okay, what movie are we watching again? <laughs> oh yeah, it's called The Beyond, and I wanted to not know anything about it, you know, before I watched it. And there it is. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I also love this movie. It has so much in excess. It's got so much uh, that's bizarre. It's got odd plot twists that don't necessarily make sense. But it all serves the, the sake of telling this goofy, nostalgic story full of gore. There's a lot that's just inexplicable, but it's just plain creepy in so many spots. So as I said earlier, for me, it was a real throwback to watching Zombie and all these other movies in the 80s uh, with my best friends in high school. So I really loved going back to that feeling of of sharing that. And I suppose, you know, I would rate it either a one or two on the scarometer. I might give it an extra little bump up for that tongue pierce sound effect (laughs) 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 that some of you missed, but I was right there for it. I don't know (laughs) why my ears were particularly tuned into that. And uh, as far as how much I like the movie, I would probably give it a seven and a half. Well, I picked this movie and I'm biased, but (laughs) I love this movie. 
Um, it's less a movie and more of a pitch to like a latex company for <laughs> like materials to provide for an effects reel or something. Um, it's dumb. It doesn't make any sense. I love everything about it though. And, uh, you know, the eyeball gore, the, the, <laughs> the contacts, the, I just, the, there's, there's just a lot to love. And again, I, th- I, every time I watch it, I, I'm transported immediately back to a, the specific place that I watched. This was a buddy's dorm room on a 10 inch television. <laughs> oh gosh, that's perfect. And we were, we were losers. We were, you know, 19 year old kids shut in on a Friday night, watching a bunch of movies and eating popcorn at a dorm on U of M campus. And he was like, Oh, I want to show you this movie that I guarantee you've never seen before and just go with it. And, um, usually when he would share something like that with me, it wouldn't be so great. And then I was taken by everything with this movie and it was just wrapped with a neat little bow with that perfect ending, a great score. Um, I love this movie. So for, yeah, for the scare meter, it's, it's a one or a two. There's nothing particularly scary to me in the movie. Honestly, the music is a little more haunting than anything else. Mm-hmm. So that's what makes it maybe a two for me. Uh, for my ranking, I'm going to go... I don't want to say ten. So I'm going to say nine. Because it's not perfect, but I boy, do I love it. And I watch it pretty much every year around spooky season because it's... Uh, it's it, yeah, it just gets me... It's me in the mood. All right, so that was The Beyond. And if you like what you heard today and you want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aedl.org. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been What Scares Us. What Scares Us.